so today we're going to talk about uh, the first part of the muscle section, which includes, uh, we're just going to go over briefly muscle function and types, and then we're going to spend most of the time talking about muscle contraction, exactly how muscle contraction takes place. So um, as far as function, most of us kind of already understand the function, producing body movements, walking and running, we know that muscles uh, take care of that. Uh, posture, so right now your head is probably not just drooped onto your chest, uh, it's, it's being held upright and there's a lot of feedback and even though you're not aware of it, um, that's taking place and, uh, and so we can talk about that because you're, even though you're not consciously aware of it right now, um, you do have conscious control over it. You can move your head if you want to. So that involves a uh, skeletal muscle, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, moving substances within the body. Well, usually that includes the heart, which is, which is not conscious. Okay. So that's not voluntary control. Um, you can't speed up or slow down your heart at will. You can, you know, meditate or you can think of something scary and it may change, uh, but you can't decide when to pump and when not to pump. Uh, moving substances within the digestive tract. Now that stuff's happening all the time automatically, uh, and we certainly don't have any control over that. And then generating heat. We can shiver, um, and that's, you know, that's very important to, uh, to keep us from getting cold because we start to, you know, as the more, the more your muscles are used, the more ATP you're producing, uh, the more glucose you're burning is what that is, and in the process you generate a little bit of heat. Okay, so there are three different types of muscles, uh, skeletal, which is what we're going to be talking about almost exclusively, and there's also cardiac, and we'll talk about that when we cover the cardiovascular system, so, so we'll, come back. we'll come back to this one uh, in the next section. And smooth muscle, now smooth muscle is what you think about in terms of like blood vessels, um, and then your, your uh, intestines, so... Um, those are under smooth muscle control in your stomach and and a lot of the things that uh, bronchi tend to be smooth muscle uh, so a lot of the things that you're not aware of that that usually just either either get smaller or or constrict or or dilate in the case of the intestines as we'll see when we when we cover the uh, digestive system you also have peristalsis uh, which is how food is moved down through the uh, through the uh, GI tract. Okay, so just briefly, uh, just a few things you need to know about cardiac muscle right now. Of course, we're going to cover that later. Uh, it's found only in the heart. Okay, so that makes sense. Appropriately named, uh, and it's striated. Okay, so uh, we'll talk a little bit more about striations, but 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 I'm going to go ahead and say now when I was you know, a kid, and I heard about striated muscle. I thought the stri the striations were this way, you know, because I'd have, you know, a piece of steak or, you know, a roast or something like that, or chicken, and it would peel off in these nice little strips, and I thought that's what the striations were, but that's not correct. The striations are this way, okay? So these are the striations, and they line up nicely in both cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle. So both of those are striated. So these are the striations. And you can see these here. You can see the lines as they, as they go in this direction. And that's very important because the purpose of striated muscle is to squeeze in this direction. And what happens is that these guys individually will move closer together. So, so these striations kind of squeeze together and that's what causes the muscle to contract. Okay, uh, it's involuntary. Now that's a difference because skeletal muscle, skeletal, is voluntary. Okay, and that's a big difference between one of the major differences between cardiac and skeletal muscle is that you can't control your heart individually. You can control the rate to some degree, but that's that's not actually controlling the muscle. Um, and so while skeletal is is voluntary. Uh, Cardio, cardiac muscle is involuntary. Okay, uh, it's not consciously controlled, and we're going to see exactly how it's controlled when we cover the cardiovascular system. Smooth muscle is most certainly involuntary. Okay, and because it's a little bit less ordered, so it tends to sort of wrap around like a uh, a blood vessel. So you can kind of see where it's where it's a little bit more disordered in the way that it's put together. Okay, so if these are individual smooth muscle cells, they kind of go in not, not entirely 
disordered, but they're but they're kind of in a in they're arranged differently so that they can actually constrict usually around like something like like a uh, like a blood vessel or like I said your bronchi. Um, so this is supposed to be something that's like this, and and the smooth muscle can be arranged so that when it's told to constrict that it will actually close up the diameter and it might make it, it as it constricts it might make it smaller okay well I guess if it's going to constrict it's going to make it smaller okay so it can constrict and dilate and that kind of thing uh, but it's not a shortening so most muscle like skeletal muscle I shouldn't say most but skeletal muscle would constrict in this direction while smooth muscle doesn't tend to do that it can it can it's it's usually to make some kind of a lumen like the stomach you know the stomach has uh, smooth muscle that will that will make it smaller and it'll sort of make it grind up food okay so this is where it's constricted right there and it's grinding food and moving it around okay so that's a that's a major difference between uh, smooth muscle it's involuntary and it's not striated you can't see those striations it works in the same way uh, but because it's so disordered, you don't see the, the those nice little lines that are lined up. Okay, so now we're going to talk about skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle, um, it's named that because it moves bones. That tends to be what it does most of the time. You have the diaphragm, which is uh, used to uh, sort of increase the size of the chest cavity to pull the lungs uh, so they can take in air. It's not necessarily moving bones, but for the most part, it's moving, it's moving bones, so we call it uh, skeletal muscle. Um, it's striated, so we've already talked about that, and we're going to get into more about, about what those striations are. Uh, it works mainly in, voluntary, in a voluntary manner. Okay, so again, if we, if we think about, so that means uh, it can be, and I think that's kind of the key, it can be consciously controlled. Like I said, you're holding yourself in a certain posture, so you're not consciously thinking about all of the muscles that you're contracting, but if you want to change your posture, you can, and it's the same thing uh, like with the diaphragm. You know, you, you will breathe all night. You don't have to think every time that you're going to breathe, uh, but if you decide you want to take a deep breath or you want to blow air out, you can. You do have, you can consciously control it, okay? Uh, and this is this is what I was just saying. Uh, most skeletal muscle are also controlled subconsciously to some extent, um, and and I use the example of the of the diaphragm. Okay, so the diaphragm muscle that pulls on the on the lungs. Okay, uh, so here again we can see the uh, the striations, and these are the striations in this direction. Okay, we're not talking about the strands that that you know, form the muscle like this. We're talking about these types of striations and we'll see why that is so critically important. All right, okay, some interesting stuff here uh, and also good for, you know, exams and stuff. Uh, the number of skeletal muscle fibers is set before you are born. It seems like we know that you start out sort of with the, uh, with a certain number of brain cells and then you don't create more brain cells, something that isn't as widely known is that you have the same number number of skeletal muscle fibers now let me just say this right now when we say skeletal muscle fibers we're talking about muscle cells muscle cells okay so it's the it's the same word so muscle fiber equals muscle cells um, and um, most of these last a lifetime. So that means that little tiny little baby that comes out has as many muscle cells as it will ever have. Okay, so and you know, of course, it's not, you know, big and buff, uh, which means that the muscles grow. So our muscles get bigger through time uh, and we have some level of control over that. And we call this increase in growth hypertrophy. It's not hypertrophy, it's hypertrophy. Okay, so, um, so that's an increase in muscle size. Okay, so that's just size. It's not muscle number. So when you go and you, you, know, you hit the gym and you start lifting heavy things, uh, that you're not increasing the number of muscle cells you have. You're just increasing the size of the muscle cells you already have, and that's hypertrophy. Uh, shrinkage can cause by can be caused by atrophy. Um, 
and sometimes when we talk about atrophy, sometimes we're talking about muscle cells that simply go away. Okay. Now, they can also shrink, uh, but sometimes with a lack of use, the body is, you know, it's as efficient as it can be. And at some point, it'll say, you know, why am I, why am I feeding this muscle? Why am I working so hard to keep this muscle around when it's just not used? And so uh, a lot of times with disuse and disease, these muscles will shrink first. And then, you know, if there's nothing, you know, if, the, if it has no purpose, uh, it will just, the body will just say, okay, you know, you're out. Goodbye. Okay, um, and so we know that we do have growth uh, a lot around the time of puberty. Um, testosterone increases in testosterone will will stimulate muscle growth. We talked about the endocrine system, and so you know these muscle cells have uh, have nuclei. Actually, they have numerous nuclei and skeletal muscle, and testosterone will go in there and say, "Hey, we need to increase." The number of strands, or the number, uh, the the amount of protein within this muscle cell, and so growth hormone and testosterone directly affect the genes that are expressed and the proteins that are made, and this muscle can get larger. Okay. Okay. So it programs, or it 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 activates the genes to tell it to increase the size, so it causes hypertrophy. Okay. All right. Um, so just briefly, when we talk about a muscle, it's it's good to get kind of um, acclimated to what we're talking about. When we talk about a muscle, we're talking about the whole muscle. Okay. So that means in your in your arm, if this is a bicep muscle, that's the muscle. Okay. But it's broken down into a couple of other smaller units. One of these is the fascicle. Okay, so this if this if this entire thing is the muscle, then it has a number of fascicles that are that are inside it. Now, what's a fascicle? A fascicle is a group of muscle fibers. Okay, and remember, muscle fibers means muscle cells. Okay, so that's what we see here. We see a muscle fiber or a muscle cell. So it has its own membrane and a couple of other things. Uh, I don't know if this is big enough, but you can see right here it has it has nerves and it has blood a blood supply going around it. Why is that important? Because the nerves are on the outside. The muscle and 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 the blood vessels are on the outside. It's important because you know what's doing the work? This little tiny thing, I don't even know if you can see it, these little tiny guys coming out right here. These are the ones doing the work. So that means this nerve right here, the yellow thing right there, has to get the message all the way inside to, gosh, I almost need a different color, has to get the message all the way inside to these guys in here to get that signal so they all can contract at the same time. So when we send the signal down through our motor neurons and say, hey muscle, contract, then this whole area has to contract. The whole area that's innervated by this particular motor neuron, that, that little yellow thing in there. I hope you can I hope you can see that okay. I have some other pictures, so hopefully that makes more sense. And so yeah, this uh, these little tiny filaments that are inside this thing called the myofibril, okay, okay, are are what's actually doing the work. So if we just focus on that muscle cell here, this thing right here, this guy, it has these little myofibrils, and within each one of these myofibrils are these are these tiny little filaments, and that's what's doing the work. And that's actually these guys are actually what we're going to continue to talk about. So there's this hierarchy, big muscle. Smaller units are fascicles. Smaller than that are the actual muscle cell. Okay, And then inside the muscle cell are these littler things called myofibrils, and then the filaments are inside that. I know, it's a, it's a, there are a lot of little terms there. Okay, so if we look at, this is a muscle cell. 
Okay, so this whole thing is the cell. Okay, so also some also we call that a fiber, muscle fiber. And let's say that we want to, and we haven't talked about these striations, but you can kind of see this is these are the striations right here. Okay, so we can see how it's so, so we can kind of see that there's something going on with this, and these little filaments here are arranged in such a way. And now I want you right now to sort of imagine that you see the little red line here. And then you see the little blue lines here. Imagine these guys sliding past each other, okay, like an accordion. So, so they're sort of pushing on each other, and that's going to shorten it. Okay, so, so that's ultimately what we're after, but we have to get that signal in here. And we can see this thing. This is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. You're going to have to know what that is and know what's in it. There's a clue. Calcium is contained in there, and that's what's going to cause the muscle contraction. We'll see how that's done. But you have to get, remember, the nerve fiber is sitting out here, okay, telling it what to do. So we have to get that signal inside. So we have these other things. See these little yellow guys right here? Okay, these are T tubules. So when this, and you can see one, I just put that neuron accidentally right over one. But you can see one right there. So when this, what happens is this neuron is going to depolarize the muscle cell. Okay, depolarize in the same way that we just learned about neurons depolarizing. So it's going to release something called acetylcholine, and it's going to depolarize it. So it's going to change the membrane potential from negative 70, and it's going to go up to whatever plus 30. But that signal has to move in here, and it does that through these T-tubules. So that depolarization and action potential, just like the action potential of our neurons, moves all the way in, and that's going to cause calcium to be released from here, and that's going to cause these guys to slide right past each other, and this whole thing gets shorter. And it's going to happen in all the areas that are innervated by this motor neuron, okay? Okay, so let's let's go into a little bit more detail. If we if we really focus in, and we look at this, um, let's see, sarcoplasmic reticulum. That's where it's written. So this blue thing right here is the sarco. I'm just going to abbreviate it, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and it has lots and lots of calcium in it. Calcium is an ion with a plus two charge, so it's filled with calcium. And here's our Here's our T-tubule. So we have a depolarization that happens out here. Okay, this is a little bit simplified because we saw that it can actually travel quite a ways. And then we have an action potential that will move down into these T-tubules and it'll cause calcium to be released and the calcium is going to affect these guys. So we just, we just kind of um, magnified what we were seeing earlier. And so we can kind of see, okay, they're little, you know, I don't know, golf club looking things, but those are, those, this, this here, the little things that look like golf clubs in this picture, that's myosin. And then the red things right here, these little filaments here are actin, okay? And so we usually say myosin are thick filaments and actin are thick thin filaments, okay, because that's what they look like under a microscope. These look thicker, okay, so they look like they're they're taking up all that space right there, so they're thicker, and the myosin are just these thin little things right here that are thinner, and that's where the magic happens. So as soon as the calcium is released from this sarcoplasmic reticulum, so it's, it's in there right now, as soon as it's released, it's going to cause these little golf club looking things to start to walk, okay? So they actually, so if that's one of those, well, that's a horrible picture. But if that's one of these, and I have really good pictures, I don't know why I'm drawing it, and it will actually walk. So this thing will will just, just, yeah, it just walks along this and it pulls it and this whole entire thing will get shorter, okay? So, and I'm going to spend about six different ways explaining that. So if we look, if we look back out at the whole thing, remember we have our motor neuron here. 
that releases acetylcholine. It moves in through the T-tubules and calcium is released. So let's look at a little bit more detail. And then it causes, it causes this thing to, this is the sarcomere from here to here. We call that a sarcomere. And that's the functional unit is going to get shorter. Okay. Right there. So this is going to be pulled in. And now, gosh, this is a really small picture, but I have bigger pictures. Um, and now these little myosin heads, these little purple things right here, these are the heads right there. Those guys are going to sit there and they're going to walk. I'm trying to do hand signals, but I realize you can't see that. Uh, but they're going to walk and they're going to pull that actin fiber in and they're going to shrink or shorten this sarcomere here okay that says sarcomere same word as that okay uh, and so that's what we're doing but but why don't muscles work all the time and we see a little picture down here of a close-up of actin don't worry we're going to see other pictures lots of them and, and you can see that there are other proteins involved too, okay? Little proteins that are saying, hey, I'm not ready to walk yet. I haven't been told to move out of the way. And so the myosin head that's going to walk along it doesn't have access, okay? So let's, let's zoom in on this and look at it a few different ways, okay? So are we, are we orientated, oriented? Um, remember... This is the muscle fiber, this whole big thing here. It's the muscle fiber, the muscle cell. These are the myofibrils. And then if we look at each individual of these guys, the myosin and actin coming together, that's what this is. So let's let's just focus on those on those filaments because that's where the real work takes place. So now imagine those little purple myosin heads are just sort of going bloop and they're and they're they're moving changing conformation so they're going from this position to so if they're if they're like this they're going from that position to that position okay so they and they keep doing it and then they expand back out so they they keep going this way and then they go, they expand back out, and they just keep walking just like that, okay? So that's blown up. They usually occur in pairs, and they kind of wrap around each other, and they just bind. They just bind to the, uh, to the actin, okay, so to, to that actin filament. This, these, again, these are also myosin, okay? So the focus here is really on the myosin, and they're, they're kind of all grouped together, and they'll just sit there, and each one of these guys will bend and as they're attached to the actin will walk and they'll shorten again repetition is always nice they shorten the sarcomere okay so this is the sarcomere and as they walk it gets shorter okay all right so if we talk about what that means the myosin okay the myosin are these guys like i said they usually occur in pairs so there are a couple of them. That's probably a horrible drawing. Um, but they appear, they, they're in pairs, but then the, those pairs are paired with other pairs. So they're in, they're in these really big groups, okay? So that's what this was trying to show you, is that, is that they're actually in these big groups, and that's what makes them thick, okay? So the my, myosin func functions as a motor protein. Okay, and we have lots of examples of motor proteins. Proteins are actually, some of them are actually very amazing, uh, and they walk just like just like a person can walk almost. They have these they have these feet that will that will just, depending on you know whether ATP is bound or something, will just start out expanded and then they'll move in this direction, and and they walk just in that way. Okay. All right, so they convert ATP into the energy of motion. We're gonna we're gonna talk exactly, uh, pretty much how that takes place. Okay, but they change the conformation. Or they change the ATP binding and then being hydrolyzed will cause the shape of this. So that means that when you walk or when you move a muscle, you're burning a ton of ATP. 
Okay, so projections of each myosin molecule protrude outward, okay, and they're protruding outward toward the actin. Okay, so we have myosin. I'm just going to draw one here. That is associated with an actin filament. Okay, and that's what it's walking along. So it will walk, 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 and and instead of because this is sort of frozen in place as it's trying to walk along this actin filament what it's doing is it's pulling the whole thing in one direction and that's what's causing your muscle to shorten okay so actin molecules provide a site where myosin head can attach here and in relaxed muscle myosin is blocked from binding to actin so when your muscle is relaxed here i'll try to use a, a different color uh whoa, too big um but when normally, when your muscle is relaxed, whoa, I'm losing control here. Normally, there's something blocking it, and that's something. So there's usually something that's there that says, nope, we're a relaxed muscle. You can't walk along me. So if this red thing down here is the actin, and this is the myosin that wants to pull on it, there's something called tropomyosin. Notice that's spelled wrong in one of the quizzes. Um, but there's something called tropomyosin that blocks it and says, nope, we're relaxing right now. Okay? So that's the goal of calcium is to get this tropomyosin out of the way. So we'll talk about we'll talk about how that works. Uh, so strands of tropomyosin cover the myosin binding sites and prevent that myosin from binding to the actin and pulling on the actin. Okay? So then when calcium is released, it binds another molecule, and I'm gonna try to I'm gonna draw this, I'll make it black. What's holding it there are these little molecules, they're proteins also, called troponin, okay? And so the troponin is actually what's holding this tropomyosin right there. So the myosin head, it's trying to get to the actin, okay? So this guy's trying to get to the actin, but this tropomyosin protein is in the way. And the one that can release it and will actually turn it out of the way is this other molecule called troponin and I'm very sorry about the similarity of words uh, but that's just one of the things you're going to have to learn is troponin is the one that calcium binds so when calcium binds to the troponin it will move that tropomyosin out of the way and then as long as you have ATP present that that myosin molecule will just sit there and pull on the actin and the whole thing will shorten. So it allows muscle contraction to begin as myosin binds to the actin. So the only thing preventing it is that tropomyosin molecule being in the way. So we call this the sliding filament mechanism. Okay, so, and this is kind of significant because when they first, you know, when, when microscopes were first being uh, discovered, invented, I guess they weren't discovered, they were actually built, invented, um, that, that we were looking at muscle, we didn't know how muscles shortened. I mean, there were there were times where we thought they filled up with fluid and that caused them to get larger and shorter for, for some reason. Um, and but, but what we figured out is that there were actually these different filaments that would slide past each other. So this one, so we could say that if this is, if we're going to say this is the myosin with their heads, would pull, okay, so it would pull on the actin head and the actin head would get would move inward in this direction okay so that's happening in both on both sides so each of these would get pulled and the muscle gets shorter it's it's uh it's very magical okay um it's not magic all right so let's let's get a little bit closer and look at this is the actin Okay. And if you look at this, you can say, oh, well, the actin binding site is going to be this yellow part right here. Okay. This is, this is the actin binding site. And so here's the myosin down here that says, I would really like to, I am prepared. There's ATP. ATP is going to bind to me and I'm going to be able to attach. But it says right now, there's this strand of tropomyosin that's in the way that won't let me bind. Well, here's this other molecule, troponin, that's kind of running the show in this case, saying no tropomyosin, you're going to be right here because we're not active, okay? And so as long as that's the case, your muscle is relaxed. The, the myosin 
can't bind. Okay, so it's blocking the actin binding site. That's what we say. Tropomyosin is blocking the actin binding site, and until calcium. So if this is a molecule of calcium, until calcium comes down there and sits right there and binds the troponin, then the troponin will change its shape and it'll pull that tropomyosin out of the way. And as long as you have ATP present, it's just going to pull, pull on that actin filament. It's just going to sit there and walk and walk and walk as long as you're telling it to. Okay, so that's what we see here. We see that calcium, they made it green. Calcium has come down, it's bound to the troponin, and then it causes a, we call that a conformational change, or a shape change in the troponin, and it pulls that tropomyosin out of the way, and now look, you can have the myosin that's walking. Okay? The myosin is going to continue to walk, it's going to, it's going to pull, then it's going to release, and then it's going to recharge, go this way, pull on the next one, and then just keep going and, and it's going to pull that actin in, in one direction. So, um, so that's all you need. And really, let's just talk about that one thing. What do we need to make a contraction take place? We need to increase calcium levels in the cytosol. Do you remember where I said the calcium was? The calcium was in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay. So yes, that's all we need for muscle contraction to take place. If you were to inject calcium directly into your muscle, it would contract, okay, uh, without anything else. As long as you have ATP present and everything else is, is in good shape, it would do that because all it's going to do is it's going to bind to troponin, move tropomyosin out of the way, and then the myosin is just going to walk, okay? It's going to walk along. It's going to pull that. It's going to pull that actin. Okay. So, um, so the contraction cycle consists of four steps, ATP hydrolysis, formation of cross bridges. Okay, so, so this is a cross bridge. So you've taken two things that were, in this case, I know it's, I know it's very, whoops, I know it's very slim. Whoops, I, I, I have the wrong things there. Um, but I know it's it's a very slim space, but this these guys are actually not attached. There is no there is no bridge there. Okay, but when this attaches, we call that a cross bridge. Okay, and so we call that whole process cross bridge cycling. It binds, it rele it pulls, it releases, it binds, it pulls, it releases. Okay, so so we give names to all of these things. Uh, ATP hydrolysis. ADP plus P, and we usually put an I there, meaning it's inorganic phosphorus. I don't know why we, we do that. Uh, we could just put P, but for some reason, uh, we always put PI to show that it's not some organic phosphate. Uh, it's an inorganic phosphorus. But basically, you go from triphosphate or three phosphates to diphosphate, and then you lose a phosphate group. That's what the hydrolysis of ATP, and you usually use a molecule of water to do it. Okay, uh, so hydrolysis of ATP reorients and, and energizes the myosin head. Okay, so I said that the, the myosin will walk along the AT, or the actin as long as, so there's your myosin, it's going to walk along, or it's going to pull on the actin by walking along it, uh, as long as ATP is present. So um, the hydrolysis of ATP is actually Okay, so let's just think about this. Hydrolysis of ATP, what is going on there? Here is a non-energized myosin head, okay? So it binds an ATP, so a little ATP molecule. We'll go up there and bind, that's what that is, okay? ATP molecule, and when that ATP molecule is hydrolyzed, it energizes it, kind of like setting a mousetrap. So it's pulled in this direction, and now it's energized, okay? So that means that that ATP went to ADP plus that phosphate, okay? And so now where there was ATP on it, now it's just ADP and the phosphate group floats away, okay? Maybe maybe finds another ADP and 
forms more ATP, whatever. Uh, but, but that's what happens is that hydrolysis. Because remember, the hydrolysis of ATP, this process right here, is how energy is released. Energy. Okay? And that energy is transferred into, sometimes we say like cocking it, like cocking a gun, but I like to think of it as setting a mousetrap. You know how much energy it takes to set a mousetrap, and then it's ready to go. It's, it's ready to spring at any time, and that's what this guy is. Okay, And then there's the formation of the cross bridge, so it will attach to the actin. That's what formation of the cross bridge is. It, it binds to the actin as long as it has access, right? As long as that tropomyosin isn't in the way. And then you have the power stroke, okay? So remember, the power stroke is moves in this direction and it pulls on this actin and that actin will move in that direction. So you had an energized myosin and now you've sprung it. So you had this energized like the mousetrap and now it's sprung, okay? It moved in this direction. It pulled on it pulled on the actin, and that's what we call the power stroke. Now, I'm going to say this, and I hope you understand it. The actual energy, where does the actual energy from ATP, ATP get used? Try to understand this in setting the mouse trap. Okay, so in energizing this, so that first step where it energizes the myosin head. So it takes that myosin head from this position to this position, so it's ready to go. That's where ATP hydrolysis happens, okay? Right here, that's where ATP is hydrolyzed. Now it's energized and ready to go, and then you have the power stroke, because I'm sure there'll be a test question on it. I will say, where is ATP hyd hydrolyzed? And if you're not paying attention and you know, oh, ATP is energy, you're going to say, from the power stroke, because that makes sense, but, it, but that's not it. It's just like, where is the energy? When you set a mousetrap, where do you put in the energy? You put in the energy when you set that mousetrap, when you pull it over, and then it's spring-loaded and ready to go, and then it will snap, okay? It snaps when the little poor little innocent mouse comes along, and it will snap, okay? So you're putting the energy in, you're sort of preloading it or, or cocking it or, or, or setting it, okay? Energizing it, lots of different words for it, but that's where you have the ATP. The power stroke is just like when the poor little mouse comes, you know, just wanting a piece of cheese, pushes on something, and then snap. Okay, then it moves. That's the power stroke. So it seems like that would be hydrolysis of ATP, but because you pre-energized it, that's not where the ATP is actually being used. Okay, all right. And then you need a new ATP molecule. And when you get, because after this has all been taken place, after this has all taken place, this is still bound you need a new ATP molecule. So let's just start a new picture. Here we go. This is our actin. This is our myosin. Okay, And it's been spent. It has pulled on its actin. So it's no longer energized. And it's stuck there. In this position, it's just stuck. And it's saying, OK, you know what? I'll let go of this, but I'll only do it if I can get a whole brand new ATP molecule. You put another ATP molecule on there, and then I'm going to let go. Why does this matter? Because when someone dies, okay, they don't have any ATP. Okay? And so they're stuck with the myosin bound to the actin, and that's what we call rigor or rigor mortis when it's when someone dies okay rigor is when it's just stuck there you're out of atp you've exhausted your atp um, maybe all of it maybe part of it you may have partial rigor and so your muscle your actin is trying to let go of the or your myosin is trying to let go of the actin but because there is no atp for it to do it it can't but if you have atp okay so if atp is there and it comes down and it binds 
to the myosin head again, then it will separate. Okay, so it will it will separate, and then the process starts over again. You go ATP to ADP plus phosphorus, and that re-energizes it. Okay, so it re-energizes the myosin head. So now it's cocked, like setting the mousetrap, cocked and ready to go. And then all it has to do is come down there, stick on it, and then power stroke. Okay, so that whole process uh, takes place. And now here's a here's a nice little picture of it. Um, so um, so this is where you have your ATP, and it will energize. Okay, so the hydrolysis of the ATP. Will energize and so we go from this little picture to this one and we can see that while it was let's see actually let's let's look at it this way we can see that it's bound here okay so it's stuck here it's already pulled on the actin up here and it's just saying okay I'm just gonna sit here and I'm gonna wait stuck bound to the actin until I get a new ATP molecule and then I'll release okay so it got its ATP molecule it released from the actin and then it will energize okay and as soon as it energizes it will as soon as that ATP hydrolysis takes place and it's energized then it can bind as long as tropomyosin isn't in the way which we're assuming right now it isn't so it will bind and then you have again the power stroke okay the power stroke and then it's done Okay, the ADP leaves, everything left, and we're back up to this situation, and it's saying, hey, you know, all I need is an ATP molecule, and I will let go. If you're dead, you have no ATP, or if you're completely exhausted, you have no ATP, and you have rigor, and it just sits right there in that position, waiting for another ATP, gets it, it energizes by hydrolyzing the ATP that's where the energy is released hydrolyzes moves to that cocked position and I could just keep going over that over and over and over again but I but I won't so let's so let's back out away from the whole thing we've kind of gone through everything we've talked about everything so let's try to put it all in one big order and I didn't leave myself enough room to write here uh, but I have other pictures so here's our muscle and we have coming down to it a motor neuron okay and you have to know this this motor neuron it's a horrible motor neuron but uh, it releases acetylcholine so acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter NT for neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction M in NMJ neurotransmitter at the neuromuscular junction is acetylcholine acetylcholine is there and when the acetylcholine binds it's a nicotinic receptor which means for you right now what you need to know is that this little receptor lets in sodium okay so a little bit of review what happens when we take something that's negative a cell that's negative 70 on the inside and we let a positive ion go into it if we let a positive ion go into it obviously this is not going to stay minus 70 anymore it's going to increase okay so as soon as that goes in it the word for that is depolarizes and it will in the same way that happens in a neuron it causes an action potential okay and that action potential moves in through the sarco or the uh, t tubule moves all the way down okay so release of acetylcholine nerve impulse arriving at the synaptic end bulbs that's this guy on the um, causes many synaptic vesicles to release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft binding of acetylcholine to the receptor okay which is what i tried to draw here on the motor end plate opens an ion channel and when we say ion channel it's actually a little secret here it's actually permeable to potassium too but but sodium wants to get into the cell so badly that potassium doesn't really play much of a role here uh, so it allows the flow of sodium to the inside of the muscle cell which depolarizes depolarizes it 
and that causes an action potential just like the action potentials we see in neurons over the entire muscle okay so that T tubule lets that go all the way in through the muscle and the entire muscle will depolarize okay so the inflow of sodium makes the inside of the muscle fiber more positively charged triggering a muscle action potential okay so it has the same voltage gated sodium channels that open sequentially and depolarize repolarize all of that stuff that goes along with an action potential and it moves into the cell okay that muscle action potential then propagates to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and what's inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum? Calcium. And what does calcium do? Calcium binds to troponin, which moves tropomyosin out of the way. So that process we just talked about with the myosin binding and pulling on the actin can take place. That's it. That's a muscle. That's a muscle contraction. And then all you have to do is stop sending the signal. All you have to do is your brain has to say, okay, we've contracted as much as we want to contract. And the acetylcholine stops because it only lasts just very, very briefly. We'll talk about that when we talk about twitches. Uh, it only lasts briefly. Uh, it's broken down by something called acetylcholinesterase and it's gone. And I'll say acetylcholinesterase is in snake venom sometimes. And so if you don't have acetylcholinesterase, then your acetylcholine just kind of hangs out. Okay, your acetylcholine just kind of hangs out there and keeps that muscle contracted and you end up paralyzed. It's called a tetany and you end up just, just paralyzed. Okay, tetanus, that disease does the same thing, keeps it contracted. Okay, so let's look at a better picture. So let's go through this step by step because this is what you need to understand. Here's our, here's our motor neuron. Releases acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is inside all of these vesicles. Releases it and when it releases the acetylcholine it binds to these receptors. So these little, little blue guys here are supposed to be the receptors. And when it binds to it, it lets sodium in. And what does sodium do? It depolarizes the neuron. Now, in when we, or the muscle, when we were talking about the nervous system, and we said, you know, you have summation, it may or may not cause the next neuron to fire. In the case of motor neurons, it always fires. It will always go. So if you tell a muscle to contract, as long as you have all the right all the right electrolytes and everything is in good shape, as long as you say go, it's going to go. And then you have the muscle action potential, the same as the action potential in neurons, and it moves down this T-tubule, and then it gets down here. So we're not worried, too worried about the uh, this little relationship here, the DHP and the ryanidine receptor. We're not we're not too concerned about that. But these are a couple of calcium or uh, voltage sensor. This is a voltage sensor that says, hey. So this one is this guy is saying, hey, we've just depolarized. Something has happened. Something has caused this muscle cell to, de to depolarize. Either we've been shocked by something or, which is usually the case, acetylcholine was released, which caused the depolarization. It moves down there and it says, okay, we've been depolarized. So that means we have to tell this guy, this other little receptor here called the ryanidine receptor, we have to tell him to open, okay? That's my job. My job is to sense the voltage change, tell the ryanidine receptor to open, and when it opens, it will, and I hope the next picture shows this a little better. So this is, yes, it does. It says, hey, open and let out, release the calcium, release the kraken. So release the calcium. The calcium comes down here, and what does it bind to? It binds to troponin, okay? So anodine receptor intercite calcium, and then right there we see it. it binds to troponin, which moves tropomyosin out of the way. So this is the tropomyosin that was in the way, this little filament that's going around here like this. That was the tropomyosin that was in the way, moves it out of the way, and lo and behold, the myosin is able to access the actin, and it sits there, and it pulls, and it pulls, and it pulls, and it shortens 
the sarcomere. So this is the what we call the Z line. Okay, so that's what makes up each side. So so it will shorten that whole thing by the myosin walking along, and that's the process that takes place. So you can sort of imagine that any kind of interruption in this entire process uh, can can really can really mess things up. Okay, so I hope I hope all of this made sense. Um, I know I kind of I, even though it was almost an hour, uh, I know I kind of went through it a little bit quickly, but hopefully repetition was uh, was good enough. And I will, uh, and that's it. I will come. We have another part that's uh, that's coming up as well.